So hello, this is the Unleashing the Gorilla Corn talk for DevOps at very large enterprises. But before we get started, we're gonna do some quick intros. So my name is Sean Sterling. I've been a DevOpsy sysadmin kind of guy for the last 20 years. I've worked at uh, large enterprises myself directly. I now work for a company that specializes in cloud transformation, and I've since worked for several massive enterprises. Among other things, I am the guy, which is uh, a talk that I've done that's on the YouTubes that you can find, or the link is up there. I contribute to a bunch of open source projects, and I have a wicked beard, so if there's like a zombie apocalypse or something, just follow me because the beard will know what to do. Um, I have a website that I never update. You can check that out. It's really exciting. Um, you can look at me on Twitter, but I don't tweet. But if you tweet at me, I promise I'll reply, and I'm totally going to post those pictures that I just took. Hi, so my name is Nan. So I've been a hardware engineer by trade. I've been doing software and DevOps uh, type of things for, for the past seven years. I've seen the challenges at very large enterprises at multiple of them. And um, this is my first time talking in front of more than 100 people, so I'm kind of nervous and also very excited. So the company we work for is called Source Group. We're a very boutique shop, but we have a global reach. We are focused on helping large enterprises do cloud transformation, focus on security, governance, and compliance. So we have an office here in Toronto, and one in Kelowna, BC, where uh, Sean is, Vancouver, as well as in Singapore, Melbourne, and Sydney, Australia. So we're, we're always hiring, so come talk to us if you're interested. I'm not gonna bring the beer things out, but we do have one, though. <laughs> in the 1970s, there was a riddle book that posed the question, where does an 800-pound gorilla sleep? And the answer is, wherever it wants to. And I can understand why. You try telling this magnificent creature where, what to do. So when you go see gorillas in the wild or uh, at the zoo or anything else like that, what you need to remember is not to make eye contact. And large enterprises are kind of like that as well. Don't show signs of aggression. <laughs> they even invented special gorilla glasses so that you don't accidentally make eye contact. I kind of hope that they make some like special glasses for large enterprise CEOs, but not as far as I know yet. So never underestimate the strength and anger of an angry gorilla or a large enterprise. So since the 70s, an 800 pound gorilla has kind of metaphorically been a term to describe uh, organizations that are too difficult to challenge directly. And oftentimes that means large enterprises. When I say large enterprises, I'm talking about the type of companies where they have like more than 10,000 employees and they're spread out very geographically diverse. And just like real gorillas, they're not really used to people telling them what to do. Or maybe if you do tell them what to do, they might not always listen. This makes it a challenge to deploy DevOps style best practices at them, but we'll see what we can do. We're talking about the kind of companies when we ask the question, what vendors do you guys use? The answer is everyone. Maybe they switch vendors every couple years to keep them on their toes, or maybe they acquire like five new companies every year, so the vendors are always changing and are constantly surprised. One of our customers had three separate vendors that were all competing in the same market space at the same time. So we got all three of them on a conference call and got them to recommend a future roadmap for the company. And then we just stood back and started to watch the sparks fly. So I don't know if you know this, but like vendor salespeople have a tendency to exaggerate a little bit. And when you get, <laughs> so if you get three of them on the same call at the same time, all talking about their product, the one-upmanship and boasting is breathtaking. And they start to trash talk each other's product, but they don't really know each other's product very well. So it gets pretty funny pretty fast. That we didn't record this call is one of the biggest regrets of my professional career. <laughs> Either way, the insane amount of vendors usually ends up being a mess. Or is it art? So quick audience poll. Who thinks this is priceless art? All right, and who thinks this is just a random experiment? Cool, it's, a, it's an experiment, but it looks like something my two-year-old might have done for reasons only known to himself. So when you look at the typical enterprise new technology adoption curve, you tend to see that large enterprises are kind of behind the curve most often. And it's not that large enterprises haven't seen what the cool kids are doing in the space, it's more that it's hard to turn a cruise ship on a dime. Or to change gears on a small company is no problem, but in a big company, a large enterprise, it can take some time. But some enterprises have seen what the startups are doing and they want to get involved, and they bring in companies like ours to help them teach them modern DevOps style practices. 
But some of these enterprises have a scale that's hard to even imagine. To give you an example, one of our clients has a yearly IT budget that is over $2 billion. They're trying to move 2,000 products to the cloud. They have hundreds of different dev teams, anywhere from two to 20 developers per team. So it's, it's kind of hard. So one of the ways that we like to, to help is by going viral internally. And what I mean by that is we try to get the DevOps teams excited about what they're doing. And we do that by showing them the value of what's going on, taking them on the whole cloud journey, and then we try to start by selecting what we call a masthead application. And then we convert that application you know, using cloud native services and trying to do it in a cost efficient manner. But choosing the right app masthead application is a bit of a trick, especially when you might have like 2,000 different products to choose from. It could take months just to even evaluate all your potential candidates. We need to pick something that's within the appropriate risk appetite, something that's meaningful to the success of the business, something that's having uh, recognizable branding for the company, like if it's some product that nobody's ever heard of, it's not gonna work very well. Something that's actually experiencing scale and cost constraints or something like that, because you don't wanna do something on an app that nobody's using and nobody needs to convert. But above all, we need to get the right team behind that product, because we're gonna be making a lot of changes and getting it you know, cloud native. And we wanna do something that's gonna ignite change and enable shared learning. And after that, just like Bob, you're sailing. Because if you do the masthead application right, the organization is gonna be doing these demos internally over and over. And I kind of feel sorry for the team that does the masthead application because you can only do demos so many times before you get bored of it. And there's several other methods and optimizations that we help organizations with. For example, this is your typical change control process. You're usually sending something to a review board or a review panel, something like that, before your merge is done. And then once that change gets approved, then you have to get a change window assigned and then work it out that way. And then maybe you have to do it all twice because you're treating your staging environment just like production environment. And then maybe you got a rock, paper, scissors to figure out who's gonna stay up late and do the outage. Or maybe it's a Fortnite game or whatever the kids are playing these games, I don't know. But having actual humans involved in your change approval process tends to create a linear process in the amount of applications and changes that you can do and the amount of change reviews you can do. And anything that has a linear relationship like this, that has lots of humans to interact with, tends not to scale very well. So obviously the next step is to kill all humans. And it's about time too, because we humans have been doing so many stupid things for such a long time, like injecting vegetable oil into our bodies because we don't even want to lift. Or getting tattoos on our eyeballs. I don't even have words for this one. <laughs> it could be that we humans are in fact too stupid to live. So maybe killing all the humans is the best solution. But if your organization's not ready to welcome our new robot overlords, then maybe we make it our goal to keep the amount of humans involved to as few as possible. We do this by automating all the things. So when your organization has over 100 separate business units, each with their own dev teams, and each getting, each getting each application to adhere to the organizational policies and procedures becomes extremely difficult. We try to manage this by using what we call an opinionated pipeline. So the opinionated pipeline allows us to set up the opinions of the application team and then merge them with other teams like security and operations. This allows the application team to just ask for a database. And they don't care too much about encryption at rest or any of those type of settings, but the security team does care about those type of settings. Or maybe both teams don't really care about your backup frequency, but your operations team does care about your backup frequencies. So we take all of those opinions, and we merge it into one thing, and we deliver that as an outcome so that each team doesn't have to deep dive into other disciplines. Because an application team just wants to get their application up and running. It's hard to find developers who are good at developing let alone good at security and infrastructure and monitoring and databases. So the opinionated pipeline prevents this train load of corporate policies from running down this poor application team and getting them overloaded. It makes it easier to do the right thing. The opinionated pipeline also allows us to approve the holistic change pattern rather than the individual change. This makes it so our change control process is no longer a linear process. Once the change pattern is approved, teams can go crazy with it. So the CICD servers are no longer tools for just developers. We can use stuff like opinionated pipelines so that we can go faster and increase our governance and security posture by utilizing compliance as code. This way we can get security involved at code commit time rather than after artifact creation. 
But we're going to talk more about security in a couple slides. So now we can have our compliance team adhe adhere to our governance and compliance using compliance as code. First, we need to identify all the types of compliance that we need to adhere to. And in Canada, this is usually like PCI, PIPEDA, PHIPAA, and as of last week, GDPR, and all the you know, policy updates that we've got <laughs> in the last couple weeks. You're gonna wanna kind of disable all of the non-compliant services as possible. It's easier to do this on some cloud vendors than others. And then create some CICD jobs to create some cloud native assets like config rules and Lambda functions, WAFs, web application firewalls, and they'll all manage those rules for you. This simplifies your future audits and assessments because your governance and compliance is front and center in that pipeline, and it makes it easier for your auditors to review. Because we can't forget about security on the cloud. If major companies like these, like Uber, Instagram, Viacom, DXC, and even the NSA are having security problems like this all the time, how can we expect ourselves to not have the same level of problems? Because there's always gonna be that one person who is gonna accidentally their cloud credentials in some public S3 bucket, and then the next thing you know, you're gonna be running the maximum allowable number of servers in your account mining bitcoins for some Chechenian hacker group. It happens all the time. This one happened last week. Poor Anthony in there only had his credentials posted for five minutes, and he was running the maximum number of, of a whole bunch of different large size instances, likely mining bitcoins or Ethereum or whatever the kids do. There's a bunch of programs out there that'll look for your Git history for those tasty credentials. And there's a pretty cool open source project out there right now called GitLeaks. You can grab this on GitHub, and it'll scan your own Git repos for those credentials. You probably wanna add this to your own uh, pre-commit hooks over the break or maybe at lunchtime or something. It's awesome. In security, we're always talking about security like an onion with its layers. Well, who wants to eat an onion? Maybe that seal from a couple slides ago, but I think most people would rather eat delicious pancakes. I also like the top pancake because, or presentation pancake, because it puts a delicious syrupy butter whipped creamery face on security instead of some crusty old onion. And there's only like 189 results on Google right now for security pancakes, so I think I've coined the phrase security pancakes as a replacement for security onion, and I need everybody's help to make this catch on. Hashtag security pancakes. So now that we have this pipeline, I wanna get security involved in the pipeline like as soon as possible. Don't wait, don't put it off. This is gonna be outside of their wheelhouse, so it's gonna be up to us to help them make it a pleasant experience for them. Maybe start with some static code analysis and turn that on to report only mode initially because that thing is gonna blow up. And it might bruise the egos of some of your developers, so give them their space for a little bit and always be polite and professional because we're all in this together to get those bugs out. And when you go to get that quote on your um, code analysis tool, be advised that they don't do demos or trials and the cost of the trial is about the same cost as a product for about a year. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense because otherwise everyone would just do a trial every once in a while. Next, you're wanna, gonna wanna create a container for your app even if you're never gonna run on containers. And you wanna do this because it lets you interact with your pipeline in a lot easier ways and there's a whole bunch of cool plugins that you can get. One of those plugins is a container scanning app that will track you know, everything that's installed on your container and make sure that you're all up to date. And as I was saying earlier, we need to make it easy for our security team to get involved. If you give them a brick wall worth of documentation and tell them to RTFM, you're not gonna get a lot done with them. So we wanna get that documentation up to epic awesomeness levels. I wanna have videos with step-by-step -step instructions and then I wanna work hand-in-hand -hand with security to get those first few applications out there. And then stand back, because if you get your security team excited about the DevOps pipeline, they're gonna wanna add all the unbelievable amounts of security tools out there. And they're gonna wanna catch them all, believe it. So how do you deal with automation in inconsistent environments? I got this picture from R mildly infuriating, but it should be insanely infuriating. I couldn't imagine having to look at that every day. But anyways, so this isn't the definitive answer, but just one person's take on it. I wanna start with building a standard operating environment, or SOE, or SOE, or however you wanna say it. And maybe you do one for each environment, so like one for Linux, one for Windows, one for your containers. Maybe you throw some security software on it, add some patching, and you're gonna to wanna to align to either CIS or NIST standards. And now app teams kinda of only care about that last mile, which is getting their app and whatever dependencies it needs installed. 
And I say let the app teams use whatever configuration management software they want to. Now this might seem controversial, but when you have a large enterprise with like 200 dev teams out there, getting them all to align on one configuration management software is really difficult. Well, let me put this another way. Let's say you acquire a new company and you bring them in and all their stuff is written in Ansible. What's the business value of spending three to six months on rewriting everything into Puppet because that's what your standard is? I call this the SOE sandwich. So we apply the SOE, install the app, and then apply the SOE again. This way, if the app team did something nefarious and they accidentally hit a setting, we're gonna still be compliant because we're gonna rerun that SOE. And this might mean that you have two configuration management packages going at the same time, but this is more for building like your golden AMIs or golden containers or that kind of thing. Not really for making live changes on, on instances, which we try to avoid. And all of this should be automated using CI CD tools like Jenkins or Bamboo or GoCD or something like that. As long as it's a type of server where you're versioning everything that you do in like YAML or whatever, because pointing and clicking for a CI CD server in 2018 doesn't make any sense. So talking about making changes on production servers, our preference is to use what we call self-tainting ephemeral instances. If you log into it at all, even one time, ever, it gets marked as tainted and automatically rebuilt within 24 hours. Because all the changes that thing should be done via configuration management. That way we know who did what and when, and you can set up multiple approvers so that we can make sure that we know who's doing things, and we can do audit logs, and we can have it all tied into our CI CD server so that we can test changes before they happen. And then for your monitoring, for your CPU, memory, load average, and all those fun things, these should all be viewed in your instrumentation dashboard for whatever monitoring system that you're using. Because you shouldn't need to log into a server to see what's going on. It's a lot quicker to go to your dashboarding interface. But sometimes you do need to log into servers to do those deep dive troubleshooting. Like maybe you're doing some S-Trace stuff or EPBF filters or whatever. But once you're done, we want to destroy that server because who knows what you did. Maybe you left a bunch of PCAP files all over the file system or maybe you had to install a bunch of DAPTVL so you could get your fancy flame graphs going. No problem. We're still gonna nuke it from orbit because who knows, it's the only way to be sure. And this, you wanna happen automatically. Either it's gonna happen 24 hours later or maybe it'll happen in your next maintenance window or maybe it's gonna happen two minutes later because that's what you want it to do. It just depends on what your risk appetite is. And speaking of things on fire, a large enterprise where I used to work, an exec reached out to a team that I worked with and said, we wanna set up a blog to do some internal blog posting. So no problem, they brought me in as a consult and I said, cool, let's set up WordPress. We'll set up you know, an Apache server, we'll do some backups and you know, give me like two days and I'll have it all done. They said, no, company standard Solaris and WordPress didn't work at Solaris at the time, so that all went out the window. So I didn't hear anything else about this. It kind of disappeared. Until eight months later, I found out that this dev team had rewritten a bad version of WordPress and now they wanted me to get it going on Solaris. So I did, and management was happy. They then proceeded to use that crappy Solaris blog four times in one year, and then everything was decommissioned. Some execs just want to watch money burn. But we've seen stranger things at large enterprise. For instance, I heard the following sentence while working for a very large enterprise. Quick. I need to spend six million dollars. <laughs> and what a fantastic sentence that is. You might only get to hear this once or twice in your life. And it was followed up with, how much can you guaranteed spend? So the company had a budget surplus and they needed to spend that budget by the end of the year because if we didn't, then we wouldn't get that same amount of money for the next year. So rather than save the company some money, we spent a bunch of money on stuff we totally didn't need. I've seen this in other companies as well. A friend of mine's company needed to use up some budget, so they ended up sending 30 people to reInvent, which was pretty awesome that year, but set up a pretty unachievable precedent for years after. So DevOps isn't just for technology problems. You can use DevOps type values to help solve problems, like having old accounting methodologies where you spend money you didn't need on things you didn't need because you wanted the same budget for next year. And now I'm gonna hand this off to my colleague, Nan. Thank you, Sean. So just a show of hands, how many of you have been promised to be working on greenfield projects or technologies before? Just one? <laughs> That's actually surprising. Um, I, I know personally I've been approached by working on greenfield projects or technologies, and usually this is my perception. Well, on the left side, no grass, brown. Well, on the right side, all beautiful. And you see the clear divide between the two of them. 
And what does that mean in an enterprise environment? For a, green, uh, for a brownfield project in enterprise, usually it's a dumpster fire. What's the characteristic of this dumpster fire? You don't want to go near it? You don't want to touch it? When you call the firefighter, they're going to come and say, yeah, we're just going to let it burn. An enterprise sometimes, or most of the, of the time, it's actually the same. Their approach for seeing this kind of things are their brownfield projects, which is we let it burn out, and then maybe we'll, we'll get a new dumpster afterwards. <laughs> and remember, this is 99% of what enterprise has of today. We can all do cool, cool stuff about Kubernetes, about containers, but the, the, the fact is that it's still, a lot of people have to do, deal with this every day. When you think about greenfield technology, that this is something that my daughter will love, right? Rainbows, unicorns, right? candies, marshmallows, it's how pretty. You get to play with the latest technology. You don't have any of those dumpster responsibilities. Everything's great. But that's actually not the case. Usually in large enterprise, this is what happens. So to some background, this is, the, um, this is taken in Sao Paulo. On the left side, that's the slum, where they call it the favela. Where on the right side, look, amazing, ni very nice looking apartment complex. So as of today, according to my advanced Reddit research, that building on the right is pretty much all abandoned. Why? Because there's so many break-ins. This happens in enterprise. Think about it. You're promised to go into that building. Tennis courts, swimming pools, individual pools in each unit but you're still working for the same company. You still have to talk to the same people, the same team, and go through the exact same enterprise process. Right? At some point, it's gonna be all mushed together, and then someone's gonna build a new building. So greenfield technology or paradigms doesn't solve all enterprise level problems. Think about a few years ago, Agile, or 10 years ago, Agile was gonna solve a lot of dev problems. It did, but it didn't really solve everything. Cloud was gonna solve a lot of infrastructure problems. I'm sure it helped, but it didn't solve everything. And now the perception is that blockchain is gonna solve a lot of problems, and even better, that machine learning is gonna learn to solve those problems for you so you don't have to worry about it. That's actually not true, especially in large enterprise. So I believe that the Greenfield um, does not truly help evolve enterprise. Fixing those dumpster, file, dumpster fires actually do. So how do we fix those? One simple way to do it is to migrate those onto the cloud. One thing the cloud doesn't fix, however, is your broken code. Your old Java stack, monolithic, but moving to cloud actually might help. How so? So think about that you can just do a lift, shift, lift and shift for your application onto the cloud. You get some time, you know, you get some burden off of your back about your, your infrastructure. You actually have more vertical scaling because you can get like 128 CPU core the most important thing here is that you actually buy some time. You buy time for you to actually properly refactor your broken code into proper 12-factor application. And think about using containers or other um, native services. And moving to cloud won't fix your broken culture. That's obvious, right? I think DevOps itself is a culture. Everyone here has to be a driving factor within our organization, be it large or small, especially the large ones, to be a changing factor of what we wanna see. Be the change you wanna see in the world, or just in your team as a startup. Right. So, sorry. Um, so moving to cloud actually might just make it worse. How so? Well, think about what Sean has said. How many people have exposed uh, AWS credentials into their public repos, right? If you're not ready for that kind of things, you might just hack, get hacked next day. Your cloud program shuts down, and also, your teams might not be ready. Your compliance team might not understand what exactly cloud is. Your security doesn't really know how to do security in the cloud. So remember, do a thorough process of evaluation before you do move into cloud because we really want to put security as the first and most foremost important thing. So talking about those um, broken or dumpster fires, um, one of the things that infrastructure's code has given us is the ability to code. Coming from a dev side, it's actually really important for me to emphasize that. Right? You can actually test your infrastructure now. It, wasn't, it was probably not possible 15 years ago. Right? So there are certain approaches we want to take when testing infrastructure's code. So how do we do it? Usually, we do basic linking right away. Right? Remember, this is everything that we do 
in the cloud environment. We push everything through automation. But with LinkedIn first, in some cases you can write unit tests, like Google Cloud. There are awesome rule checkers out there. You can use like a JSON checker that allows you to do requires, um, allows you to do smart defaults for your configuration. But the simplest yet most effective way is to actually deploy. Create a shadow account in, in your AWS account or subscription or project and deploy in your entire stack. We do that at one of our clients. We take the entire VPC stack, all the subnets, all the firewall rules, everything we put in there, the, the um, script proxies, and all the VMs that we use, we deploy. It takes about 10 minutes, but you can verify it right after. And then you can take it one step further, deploy a sample application on top of that. And then you can do some verifications. And the question here is then, how do you do verifications? Developers, I'm sure a lot of you love using behavior-driven um, paradigm, right? You can do that as infrastructure people now. It's pretty amazing. So here's an example of what a Gherkin file looks like for infrastructure testing. You can actually have your business people or your network engineer or your security team write this kind of language. And then you have an API wrapper behind it to actually do testing for you. Let's go through a scenario really quick. Look at the first scenario. We want to verify if our firewall resource got deployed when the test project infra deployment succeeded. That means you just basically do a query if, to see if your deployment stack is finished and successful. When any firewall rules change in the infra git repo, just do a git history just to figure out if anything changed. And then all firewall rules declared in the infra git repo should be deployed to the test project. Another simple API query to gather all the firewall rules that you deploy compared to your local file, and you have a result. And then just to make sure our network engineer is happy here, that you can add additional rules, say the business important rules, like Firewall 38 allows ingress to tag my, my sample app 353, right? And then you can also write multiple scenarios just to verify if your application works. So it's pretty cool that we can actually do testing. And now infrastructure itself, pretty much all built by second. It's a big change for, for a lot of people. So cloud has brought commoditized hardware to all of us. And as app developer, what can you take advantage of? So this is one of the most simple yet powerful paradigms that we've used. I'm sure if you guys are already in the container world that you have more advanced deployment methodologies, but for enterprise, this is actually a really good start. So what we, we use the blue-green deployment methodology to actually deploy the entire environment. Imagine you have a two-tier app, myapp.com, v1 as your uh, web tier, v2 your app tier. You build some new code, got the v1 for v1.1 for your web tier. What you could do right now is through your automation, deploy this entire stack in the same VPC under the same subnet with the same policy constraints and everything. You just deploy it, right? This gives you a temporary DNS record that you can hit, you can query, and you can even run performance testing with this because remember, all those hardware running, running underneath are the exact same hardware you're running prod today. When you're done with this, you're happy with the testing, simply do a switch of the DNS records. You actually have a release within seconds, right? And do, do remember that you also have your old stack there, so if something goes wrong, the switch back, which take another five seconds. So this is one of the simple yet way of doing cloud, uh, um, of um, releasing software or monolithic applications on cloud. In the containers world, Kubernetes supports rolling updates with replica sets. You can even put on Istio on top of it to do canary releases, traffic splitting, and you can have your performance hook hooked up in the back end just to monitor exactly what's going on. But step number one, right? And remember, cloud itself is not just IS. I've used this uh, pizza as a service 2.0 I found yesterday. I think it's actually pretty accurate. But there are many, many cool managed service, services all cloud providers provide. Manage Hadoop, manage Kubernetes, right? There are functions, Lambda functions, Azure functions, or cloud functions that you can just use as a serverless application or step functions. You can even use DLP uh, APIs to help you protect those data that you have. And you can train your models with a lot of those machine learning specific hardware that cloud providers provide to you. So enterprises can actually unlock the stack to get on the even playing field 
with technologies companies like Netflix or Uber. So our CEO and um, founder has said that don't log into the web console. That's not how you cloud. It, it might be a bit tough at the beginning, but we believe with security built into opinion and pipeline that Sean has, uh, Sean has mentioned, this is the appropriate way to do it. The tools that we usually do, de do uh, recommend would be the native ones. CloudFormation, ARM Templates, Deployment Manager. But if you do have a multi-cloud environment, Terraform or other third-party tools are never a bad choice because we believe automation, infrastructure code, added together, it's always better than going to the console and click around. I'll now hand it back to Sean for a wrap-up. Thanks, Dan. Ooh, am I on? Oh, there we go. Thanks, Dan. So we once had a, a customer that we told them that we could save them just over a million dollars per year by making just a few changes. And the reply that we got back was, not my problem, different department. So if you get to the point where you, you have the ability to save your company over a million dollars per year, that should be something that's celebrated and rewarded, regardless of where that information came from. Otherwise, you need to take a pretty hard look at your culture. So how are we doing lately? For a major enterprise in the last four months, in their um, on-prem environment, they had three dev updates and three production updates compared to their cloud environment, which we built for them. They had 48 dev updates and 24 production updates. So that's a 16 times speed increase, and that increased velocity can help you move faster and respond to disruption quicker. It also really empowers your DevOps teams. We see a lot of clients trying to do a multi-cloud strategy before they're good at one cloud. And in the words of Ron Swanson, never half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. <laughs> and this applies to many things in life, but especially your cloud strategy. At FinCooper on Twitter, defined unicorns as DevOps superstars like Flickr, Netflix, and LinkedIn and horses as companies that follow safe, traditional, reliable methods. System Templar on Twitter, that's me by the way, says that a gorilla corn is a large enterprise that embraces DevOps best practices. And the gorilla corn is even more dangerous than the regular gorilla because this one can stab you with its horn if you do something crazy like look at him in the eyes. We hope that you've seen that doing DevOps at large enterprises can make for some interesting work and we encourage you to unleash the gorilla corn where you work. And we have a bunch of these Gorilla Corn stickers at our booth, so come and grab one if you want, but we're probably gonna run out. To find out more, come visit us at our booth, uh, or visit us on our website at sourcegroup.com. We are hiring, or if you just wanna chat about some cool DevOpsy type stuff, come and pay us a visit. Thanks.